This is going to be Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to see some more things that happen at salvation. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So number one, at salvation, you go from being dead to alive. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Before you believed on Jesus Christ, you were dead. And you were walking around, you looked alive, yet you were dead in trespasses and sins. Your flesh was alive, but your spirit was dead. In Revelation 3, 1, the church at Sardis had a name that they lived, but were dead. They looked alive, but they were dead. And then 1 Timothy 5, 6 says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. So before salvation, you had a live body and a dead spirit. It needed to be quickened. And the verse said, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, as the verse said. So what does quickened mean? It means he made us alive. Quickened means to be made alive. We can see the Bible net definition for the word quick in the book of Numbers. So if you turn all the way back to the book of Numbers and look at Numbers chapter 16, and we'll look at verse 30 through 33, and we'll get the definition for the word quick. It says, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, and all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord, and it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, now look at this phrase, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So the word quicken doesn't mean to make faster. It means to make alive. Notice how in number 1630 it says they go down quick into the pit. And then in 1633 it says it went down alive into the pit. So it means, quicken means to make alive. And when the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful, it means it is alive. A book which is alive told you how to get a live spirit. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, in the same chapter that we're studying in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace through faith. And this means God gave us something we don't deserve, and letting us believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. And this isn't of ourselves, it is a gift of God. If you get a gift from someone, it is something that you gave, that was given to you, that you didn't earn, that you didn't work for. It isn't something you earn, it is a gift. Romans 5.18 calls it a free gift. And the fact that it is not of works, as the verse said, makes it free. Not of works means you can't earn it through living right and doing good things. And this includes before and after salvation. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And you can't claim to have any part in salvation other than the obedience of faith. You're obedient when you have faith. But when you believe the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, and when you rely on Jesus Christ and what he did for you as payment for sin, you are then made alive or quickened. Before this, the devil basically had a sword behind your back, walking you down a plank to hellfire. You were a dead man walking. So at salvation, you went from dead 
to alive. And number two, you went from unclean spirits inhabiting you to the Holy Spirit inhabiting you. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And something a little creepy is the fact that this verse seems to teach that all lost people have an unclean spirit. Uh, the spirit of the prince of the power of the air worketh in the children of disobedience, as the verse said. The children of disobedience would be lost people. The prince of the power of the air is none other than the devil. It isn't too hard to believe that lost people are houses for unclean spirits. Because a saved person is a temple of the Holy Ghost, a lost person is the temple of the unclean spirit. Uh, Matthew twelve forty three through 44 says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh tr through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So the saved, saved person's body is the house of God, and the unclean spirit's house is the lost person's body. So before salvation, you were the house for devils. You also walked according to the course of this world. And Galatians 1.4 calls it a present evil world. Before salvation, your mind was stuck in the world, not on spiritual things. Matthew 13.22 says, He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Now there are worldly Christians that are Christians who care more about the world than they do spiritual things. But a Christian who is in the will of God, doing what God says, has his affections on things above. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Paul said that Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. We don't want to love the world. It is the influence of unclean spirits that keep people in the world. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 1 John 5.19 says, We know that we are of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. The world is ran by Satan, the god of this world. But if you're saved, 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Satan has his henchmen, his unclean spirits that work in lost people. But if you're saved, you now have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Ephesians 2, 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. And that brings us to our next point. Number three. At salvation, we went from being Satan's child to a child of the king. Uh, Satan has children. He has children of disobedience, children of wrath. Matthew twenty three fifteen calls them a child of hell. 1 John three ten calls them children of the devil. In Acts 13.10, it calls a man a child of the devil. So God has children. The devil has children. And every time you lead a soul to Jesus Christ, you are stealing one of the devil's kids. And the moment I believed the gospel, I was changed from a child of wrath to a child of the king. And John 1.12 says, But as many as received him to them... Gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I was adopted into the family of God. 
Ephesians 2, 2 and 3 says, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Our conversation isn't just the way we talk, but also the way we live. We all had our conversation in the world, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now that I'm saved, I still have the sinful flesh, but I need to strive to beat down the flesh and to do what God wants me to do. Just because we are saved and have eternal security doesn't mean we should just do whatever the flesh wants. We need to strive for holy living. In modern day, corrupt preachers will give you the idea that sin is okay because we are saved eternally and we're saved from sin, past, present, and future. And they'll teach that they can just do whatever they want, but they just allure through the lusts of the flesh. If you look at Second Peter 2, 18 and 19, it says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty. They're promising liberty. Well, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. So these type of people that believe you can just do whatever you want and that God isn't ju is just, they believe God is just cool and hip and acceptable, they are really putting you in bondage, back in bondage of sin. A preacher who makes light of sin is promising liberty and freedom, but yet he is just bringing you back into the bondage. Sin hooks you and ruins your life, and we should strive to do what God wants and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Even though we have sinned against God, He is merciful and allows us to be saved and get our sins under the blood. Even after salvation, He keeps us saved by His own power. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So he quickens us together with Christ. Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead the third day. And when we get saved, we get in Christ. And number four. At salvation, we trade hell for heaven. Being put in Christ automatically gives you a home in heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the moment you get saved, you are put into the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is presently sitting at the right hand of God. And you are spiritually resurrected, and you are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So spiritually speaking, you're already in heaven. And that is the spiritual resurrection. The physical resurrection comes later. At the rapture, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we will get a glorified body that will be able to be taken up to heaven. And we won't have anything left in this world. And you may not realize it completely, but when you got saved, you quit going down the broad way to hell and started going the narrow way. Matthew 7:14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So if you're born again, you no longer have to worry about going to hell. If you came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner that you are, and you believed on Jesus Christ to save you as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, then you are on your way to heaven. Hell is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Is it, is it a pl it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of torments and unquenchable fire. The rich man in hell begged for a drop of water on his tongue. And you aren't going there if you're born again. You're going to a place where there will be no more sorrow or death or crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. And someone said it isn't fair for God to let people go to hell. If that's true, then it's not fair for them to go to heaven as a guilty sinner. 
Someone said, why in the world would God let people burn in hell? Why would he even let them be born? Well, God also let them be born with the option to choose him and choose heaven. You may not think about this much, but the pleasures in heaven are as great and pleasurable as the torments in hell are painful and horrible. Hell is unbearable pain, and heaven will be pleasure beyond belief. Uh, people who live in pleasure here and think it's wonderful, but that's nothing compared to the pleasures that will be in heaven. Uh, if God didn't let you be born, then he was being unfair by not giving you the opportunity to choose heaven. Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, notice that you only get the grace and kindness through the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, the wrath of God, the wrath of Almighty God abides on you. And you are at enmity with God without Jesus Christ. As we said before, you are a child of the devil if you're not saved and your destination is hellfire. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But number five, after salvation he went from working for Satan, the flesh and the world, to working for Jesus Christ. And when I say this, I'm talking to Christians who are actually doing something for Jesus Christ. Before salvation, you can work for God in that He uses lost people to sometimes fulfill His will. Uh, lost people can work for God, but they aren't doing it for God, and they aren't getting any reward for it. They're doing it for themselves, and they don't even know God is using them to fulfill His will and purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Even though we aren't saved by works or kept saved by works, God still wants us to maintain good works. And there are so many things we can do for the Lord Jesus Christ, yet many Christians will do absolutely nothing. Uh, Philippians 2.21 says, For all seek their own, that the things which are Jesus Christ's. Uh, there are so many things you can do for God, but many Christians will wake up and do absolutely nothing. Start your day like this. Get up an hour early, read the Bible and pray, go to work and act like a Christian, don't act like everybody else, witness to others, show that you are different than the lost world, come home and teach your family the Bible, witness to others, make some type of ministry to put out the words of God, anyone can have a ministry, uh, do some work for Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. A great ministry is teaching your family the Bible. A man who reads the Bible, prays, works for a living, takes care of his family, and teaches them the Bible is living a godly life. Going to work every day and giving an honest day's work is living godly. Uh, this is a great witness to a lost supervisor or co-worker. I mean, this shouldn't substitute giving out the gospel, but working hard and being honest at work will help you when you give the gospel. You will have their respect. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Literal, physical working with your hands can be considered good works works for Jesus Christ. And any Christian can do it and should do it. But next, after salvation, you went from being without Christ to Christ within. As I've already said several times, you have Christ within if, if you're saved. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm in Him and Jesus Christ is in me. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, 
and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. The Gentiles were without Christ because God promised the seed to Abraham. Genesis 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not as unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So before salvation, you had no hope. You were without God. Uh, you couldn't call on God in times of trouble like you can now. But notice the words uncircumcision and, uncir and circumcision in verse 11. In the Bible, when it says uncircumcision, it refers to the Gentiles. While when it says circumcision, it refers to the Jews. In Christ, Jews and Gentiles come together and spiritually speaking are no longer Jew or Gentile. Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The physical circumcision and keeping the commandments will do a Jew absolutely no good unless he believes the gospel and gets saved. If he doesn't get saved, he will go to hell just like an unsaved Gentile. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Non-Jews were called aliens or strangers, and if there was something the Jews weren't allowed to do or to eat, they would give it to these aliens and strangers. If you look at Deuteronomy 14.21, it says, You shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it. Or thou mayest sell it unto an alien. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. The Gentiles were the strangers referred to in that verse. They were strangers from the covenants. Uh, God made covenants with the Jews, such as the Abrahamic land grant, the Mosaic covenant the Davidic covenant, and the blood of Jesus Christ is what broke down the wall of part partition between the Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles were without hope, but now they have hope in Jesus Christ. He is our blessed hope. Ephesians two thirteen and 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So, when a Jew or Gentile gets saved, they get put in the body of Christ, which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles, and spiritually speaking, when you get saved, you're no longer a Jew or a Gentile. Now, physically, you're still a Jew or a Gentile, just like you're still a physically a male or a female. So, you want to remember, it's, spiritually you're not a jew or a gentile and not physically a saved jew is still physically a jew and this brings us to our next point before salvation you had access denied but now you have access granted because you got in the body of christ you couldn't have access to god before salvation because you were an enemy Ephesians 2.15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Jesus Christ abolished the enmity between you and Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life. He kept the commandments. He was completely perfect and died as the ultimate sacrifice for sin, shedding his blood. He is the new man that lives inside every born-again believer. He makes peace between you and God. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Ephesians two sixteen, And that he might reconcile but both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
The blood is applied to your soul, and you are reconciled to God. Ephesians 2.17 says, And he came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. So he preached peace to both Jew and Gentile, who all have to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved, or be damned for eternity. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Like I said, now access is granted. We can get in. Uh, we are in the body of Christ. We have access to heaven. We're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And at the rapture, there's nothing that's going to deny us access to the third heaven. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then Hebrews 10.19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. After salvation, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. And notice that in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Lord goes back to having a literal temple. And this is where the Antichrist will stand and demand worship. This is why the body of Christ must leave in a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble, because our body Presently, right now, our body is the temple. The Antichrist can't stand in our body, so there has to be a literal, physical temple, just like God has in the Old Testament. And if you look at Ephesians 2.19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So when you get saved, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost, it is the house of God. In the Old Testament, God has a temple for His people. Now He has His people for a temple. And we know that the church building isn't the house of God today because it isn't the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I believe that's not referring to a church building, but to the church, which is his body. And 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Um, the church is the body of Christ. But the Bible also talks about churches, which are local assemblies of believers. It isn't the building, which is the church. The Bible isn't referring to a church building as the church of God. But Ephesians 2.20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So what is the foundation of? That would be Jesus Christ. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 3.11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 2.7 says, Unto you therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is the foundation of, and we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And at the rapture, the body of Christ leaves. And God goes back to having a temple for his people. And that's where the Antichrist will stand and demand worship. A, a huge sign that we're leaving before the tribulation is because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Antichrist can't stand in us. But Ephesians 2, 21 and 22 says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And notice it says, Groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. The body of Christ is growing as time goes on, in the sense that more and more people are getting saved. And it's crazy to think about it, but the last person to get put into the body of Christ is possibly alive right now. And God is waiting on them to accept Him as their Savior 
of their own free will before the rapture. So your body is the habitation of God. Jesus Christ lives in you. And that is a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Why would God dwell in someone like you? Why is God mindful of man? God loves man and died for them. And if you're saved, then you have the blessed hope to look forward to. But this has been Ephesians chapter 2.